Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Rita uh, Rajia from uh, University of Oregon to come visit Microsoft Research. Uh, Professor Rita uh, uh, got his PhD from USC. And uh, from the uh, year uh, 1999 to 2002, he was a senior technical staff member at AT&T uh, Lab uh, Menlo Park. Uh, Professor uh, Rita has received NSF uh, Career Award for his work on peer-to-peer -peer streaming in year 2005. And uh, uh, he founded the Multimedia and Internet Working Research Group in University of Oregon. He's on the editorial board of a long list of journals and uh, a program committee of major conferences such as Infocom, IMC, ACM Multimedia, and etc. Uh, without further ado, Let's uh, hear the talk from Professor Rita. Thank you for the introduction. Um, and thanks for, thanks you guys for coming to the talk. Um, so this uh, talk is about a project that we have been working on for almost uh, three years now. And uh, the goal of this project is to understand a bit more about the actual peer-to-peer -peer systems that are deployed out there. Um, this is a collaboration with a group of people, uh, Daniel Stutzbach and Amy Rossi are my PhD students who have been uh, basically running the show, doing the work. And uh, we have collaborators from AT&T Research Labs that you might be familiar with, uh, Nick Duffield, um, Shubo Sen, and Walter Village. Okay, so let's start by sort of providing some context for this work. Um, I'm sure you have some experience with peer-to-peer -peer application these days that are increasingly being deployed, at least during the past few years, that has been the trend for a wide range of applications from file sharing to IP telephony these days. Um, some of the main reasons for peer-to-peer -peer applications, for popularity of peer-to-peer -peer application is that it's easy to deploy them. You, know, you give a copy of your application to 100 people to run, you're in business. You can just sort of connect those uh, computers together and uh, achieve the task that you want to achieve. Um, and they have this inherent self-scaling property in terms of more users join the system, you have more resources. So uh, at least available resources uh, uh, scale with the number of participating peer. So you don't need an infrastructure, you can easily deploy them. Another important uh, point is that these applications have a significant impact on the network. Um, and I'll talk more about that. Basically, when you have an application with millions of users, you can intuitively you can imagine that it has an impact on the, net, uh, on the network. Now, there are at least three reasons, depending on who you are, uh, there are at least three reasons to characterize the behavior of actually deployed peer-to-peer -peer system. Oops. Um, if you are concerned about the peer-to-peer uh, -peer system that is already deployed, you want to understand how the system behaves to uh, improve its performance, identify what the performance bottlenecks are. So that is relevant to someone who is running a Skype or running Nutella, for example. If you want to design a new application, and oftentimes, if you are working in the lab as a grad student, you can't afford to have one million people running your application. So you end up running simulation. If you want to do simulation, you need to have some understanding about the behavior of actually deployed applications, such as their dynamics like churn. You have to incorporate chain in your simulation. So you have to have an understanding of how these uh, applications behave in the wild, basically. And the third group is uh, if you want to character, if you are uh, an ISP and you want to see the impact of these applications on the network, you still have to characterize them. So there are at least three groups of people who care about this characterization, if not more. So characterization of these applications, uh, deployed applica uh, peer to peer applications are important. But it's a difficult task, and this is sort of the topic of this talk. Let me just quickly provide some background for what I mean by peer-to-peer, -peer, just for the sake of completeness. But I'm going to go fast. Please interrupt me if uh, something is not clear. Um, so the, the, a common theme in peer-to-peer -peer application is that you have a group of n systems, computers basically, 
that connect to each other form an overlay by establishing pairwise connections in order to uh, achieve a task. You know, and oftentimes they want to share resources. Either they want to share bandwidth, they want to share content, they want to share storage, they want to share resources essentially. And they don't require any special support from the network. So what you see here on the top plane, uh, you see pairwise connection between n system that form essentially a randomly connected graph, which we refer to as an overlay. But of course, underneath, some of these connections might be sharing a bottleneck. For example, these two connections might be sharing a bottleneck down there. So on, at the IP level, at the physical level, individual connections, you know, several, several connections might be sharing the same bottleneck. But at the top, at the application level, you have an overlay that uh, for some applications look like, looks like this. And of course, participating sort of nodes may join and leave the system in an arbitrary fashion. So you end up having an, an overlay, a system that is inherently dynamic. Users come and go, and you have a graph that is evolving with time. Now, given this scenario, there are some inherent properties for, for these systems. Uh, one is the scalability. More peers means, means more resources, as I said earlier. System is dynamic, naturally. You have churn in the system. Users come and go. And then you have a sort of uh, users with different capabilities. So you have a heterogeneous system. People have different um, storage size, different CPU capability, different bandwidth. So in different, there are different dimensions of heterogeneity among participating peers. And this kind of system comes in, in two flavors. There is an unstructured peer-to-peer -peer when peers connect to each other sort of randomly. And there is a structured peer-to-peer -peer where there are certain rules that who you should connect to. So let me go back and uh, sort of the structure appears to be essentially DHTs, like CAN and CORD and uh, pastries and split stream. Uh, split stream is actually something else. So, um, all right. So let me, huh? This is the structure. Unstructured. Unstructured is like Nutella. Um, Skype is unstructured. I don't know what a Skype does. The Skype is a proprietary application, so we don't know how, what a Skype. I don't know what a Skype does. Other people might know. There were some analysis, so I would say, suppose that it's structure. It is structure. So the, the general categorization is the same. If there's a random connection, it's it's uh, on a structure. If there are certain rules of how you can connect to the network, then you have a structure. So let me just. Uh, elaborate on, on uh, the point I made earlier about the impact of these applications on the network. Um, based on some studies, these applications right now uh, contribute up to 70% of traffic, internet traffic. Well, whether you trust that number or not doesn't really matter. The trend that some of these studies shows is that uh, the contribution of peer-to-peer -peer traffic uh, to the network sort of rapidly growing and this uh, green part basically shows uh, that trend. So this is just contribution of this application at one point in the network, presumably. Is it representative necessarily? Well, you can question that. Another way to look at it is the number of participants at one application. This graph in the bottom shows the population, the top line, the red line, shows the population of GNUtella peers as a function of time between October of 04 and January of 06. And the population went up from 600,000 at one point of time to more than 3 million. And today is around 6 million at one point of time. So for one application, you have up to a few million users connecting to the system at one point of time, which is another measure of impact on the network. And in terms of footprint of where they are, here is a snapshot of how peers are connected randomly to each other, mapped over uh, uh, sort of the globe, and this is an old one, and this is thin. If, if we plot this connectivity graph today, the whole page is, is going to be pink, basically, because there are connections all over the place. So again, these are three different measures of impact of these applications on the network, just to give you some sense of why we care about this application. Okay, so now, peer-to-peer -peer applications are important. There has been a lot of work on this application. Uh, since 2001, uh, when sort of Canon Cord have been proposed, and even prior to that, there have been system uh, in use. Um, but most of the research and peer-to-peer -peer applications are focusing on designing a new peer-to-peer -peer system or a new resource management peer-to-peer -peer system or new resource discovery peer-to-peer -peer system. 
sort of a new component for, peer, for a peer-to-peer -peer system. And typically, if you go and look at those papers, they evaluate what they propose by simulation. They say, okay, here is a new technique, here is a simulation, or results are better than previous results. There are, uh, and there are some that are using a small scale experiments. You can get two million people to, to try your, your new idea, to test it, to see how it works in the wide, in a large scale. There are a handful, at least back then there were a handful, now there are more, of empirical studies when they try to actually measure a system that is deployed out there and learn something about it. So the main point is that we, we don't have a good understanding of the behavior of widely deployed peer-to-peer -peer applications out there. For example, some of the important examples are dynamics. I said earlier that churn is an inherent property of this application. We don't have a good understanding of churn. We have done a study and um, briefly mentioned it, but without that you cannot run a meaningful simulation because you don't know how churn behaves. How do you incorporate, how do you set, how do you assign peer uptime in your simulation, for example? Uh, what are the properties of the overlay that is shaped and evolved over time? And what are the sort of distribution of contributed resources by peers? So all those real world uh, dimensions of these systems are not known because it's hard to characterize them in reality. And I'll get into that a little bit more as to why it's hard. So if you decide, let's say today you decide to, this is an important problem and it hasn't been solved, let's start solving it. So if you decide to characterize a peer-to-peer -peer system today, the most obvious way to do it is that you go and capture a snapshot of a system. So if this is a peer-to-peer -peer system, and right now, you essentially want to take a picture of these yellow overlay or graph and say, okay, this is the state of this connectivity in this system at this point of time. Okay? And that's what I re refer to as a snapshot. Nodes are participating peers, edges are connections. Now, if you look at this graph and characterize that graph, you can characterize overlay of this particular system at one point of time. If you're interested in the dynamic of the system, then you have to have multiple snapshots and see how these snapshots evolve over time, like watching a movie, essentially. Now, ideally, you want a snapshot to be instantaneous. You want to essentially take a picture. Right? In practice, you cannot take a picture of a system that has 5 million nodes all over the globe. So what you end up doing is typically you use a crawler. You crawl the system. The how, how crawler works is you go to a peer. If there is a support in that application, you ask, what are your neighbors? And it gives you a list of neighbors. Then you go to each one of those neighbors and ask, what are your neighbors? And you progressively learn more about the participating peers until you have the complete picture. But that process takes time, and that is where problems start to happen. If you don't have support for uh, crawler, then essentially you have a proprietary system and then your options are limited. You can observe traffic and do reverse engineering, but there's always an issue of how accurate your uh, observations are. Yes? How do you know when to stop the crawler? What is that? How do you know when to stop the crawler? I'll talk about that. Right. So, so given that sort of basic Technique, um, what is the problem? You, you, you write a crawler, you run it, let's say you know when to stop it. What is, what is difficult about it? The problem is that as you crawl the system, system is changing. Peers come and peers go. So the picture that you get from the system is blurred, is distorted. You're capturing some of the peers that arrived during the hour that you were crawling. You're missing half the peers maybe or a portion of peers that were there when you start, but they were gone by the time you catch them. So as a result, you end up having what you call a distorted snapshot. And of course, intuitively, the faster you crawl, the closer you get to instantaneous snapshot, the less distortion you're likely to have. And if you want to do dynamic analysis and look at back-to-back -back snapshot, the faster you capture the, the... So if you capture a snapshot of a Gnutella every minute, you have minute by minute view of the system so you can do fine grain analysis. But if you capture a snapshot one every hour, you have hour by hour snapshots, so the analysis that you can do on the dynamic side have a coarser granularity. So this seems like an obvious problem. So the question is how previous studies, a few previous studies on peer-to-peer -peer, uh, system have dealt with it. Well, in short, they ignored it. They basically conduct a quick crawl and say, here are the results. They don't even bother to uh, address the issue of accuracy for their uh, snapshots. Some of them try to capture complete snapshots with a slow crawler, and their snapshot takes 
an hour or so to capture, which is by definition distorted. Some of them do partial crawl. They said we crawl for five minutes. Whatever we get is, is representing the entire system, which I'll show at the end of the talk that is incorrect. And this issue, like I said, is not directly addressed. What we try to do, we try to capture a complete snapshot and try to deal with the issue of distortion, measure distortion, and reduce it as much as we can. At least we say, this is the degree of distortion in our snapshot. And capturing complete snapshot is a losing battle. The right way to go is to try to come up with some way of sampling the system. But you want your samples to be meaningful and representative as opposed to just random. Um, so we want to be able to argue about uh, the representative nature of our sample. So with that, this is uh, an overview of what the work we have done. Um, and I'm going to talk about a subset of these. Uh, we work on a crawler to tackle the problem that I just described. Using complete snapshot, we look at uh, properties of an unstructured overlay in Nutella. I'll briefly talk about that. We have done one of the first studies to characterize and actually deploy DHD, uh, which is CAD. We have done a, a detailed study on churn in three different peer-to-peer -peer systems, BitTorrent, uh, DHD, and Gnutella. We also have done some work on characterizing available files, um, again, in Gnutella. These are all based on capturing complete snapshots, as I just described. Of course, they have some distortion. Of course, there will be an error. Uh, and we tried to minimize that error. But then the second sort of venue or direction that we pursue was to try to sample peer-to-peer -peer system instead of capturing the entire system. And based on samples, we try to uh, drive their characteristics and argue that these are representative of the entire system, just based on a subset of nodes. So uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about uh, this study on, on a structure overlay briefly, and then quickly focus on sampling, and most of the talk would be on sampling. OK, so let me just briefly mention something about crawler. So the basic idea of designing a crawler is, is, is very simple. You progressively go to the nodes and learn about other nodes. So there is nothing really uh, hard about it. But when you start to develop the crawler and the process of developing one, testing it, and having uh, some le level of uh, Trust in your result is a difficult one. And issues such as how do you know when to stop, how do you know the snapshot is complete, is going to come up. So when we started, we knew that we want to have a fast crawler to deal with distortion. So we basically came up with a master slave architecture. You have a master process that coordinates uh, what peers you should, each uh, slave should crawl. And each slave opens up hundreds of TCP connections and crawl hundreds of peers at the same time. So we want to sort of go increase concurrency in order to increase the space, uh, speed. Uh, the, the, the problem that is going to come up is that you want to go fast. You want to crawl fast, but you don't want to crawl too fast. If you open way too many connections, you see a very loss, high loss rate. And this is basically you're stepping on your own toes. So you have to have some adaptation mechanism in place that allows you to adapt with the amount of bandwidth you have on your disposal, the amount of CPU you have on your disposal. If you overload your CPU, your timers are going to be off, and then you keep saying, oh, there was a timeout. But it wasn't a timeout. You just, uh, uh, the system is going to slow down because uh, you overload your uh, CPU. So basically, you want to have some adaptation in place to adjust the load that you put on your crawler. So that might affect the existing P2P behavior also? Uh, no, that doesn't because you contact each peer just once. So there are 10 million peers. Let's say I contact each one of them once. My request, which is a message sending, a message receiving, doesn't have an impact on that uh, peer, doesn't have a significant impact on that peer that might be exchanging thousands of messages in an hour. One slave learned from one peer their neighbor that slaves upload to the master, and master now makes the connection with the new neighbors. Say that again. So like when you talk to a peer, right. you know what's the neighbor for that peer. Mm -hmm. Then you upload that information to the master. Now master establishes the connection with new peer? No. Then the master knows what are the new names that we collected. If they haven't been uh, crawled before, it put them on the queue of nodes to be contacted. That's it. Okay, so my question is master establishes the contact to the new nodes. 
master slaves, slaves only contact him. Slaves talk to outside world. Master do not talk to outside world. Or more like master decide whom should slave talk. Exactly. Yeah, that was the coordination. Yeah, but it doesn't impact the system. That's I thought that's what you were getting at. Yes. So this is very much like crawling the web, right? And there has been an enormous amount of research on building faster. Uh huh. Uh huh. There's a company that starts with a G, which has built an uh, enormously large web crawler. Right. Uh, so. Um, how does your world relate to? Well, the, the difference, the main difference, it is in nature, is in a sense exact same problem. The main difference is that web, in web, web pages do not come and go away in two minutes. Whereas in peer to peer system. Even in the web page. Right. Even in the web page does come and go in two minutes. Right. So then, then you have the exact same problem. So you have the exact same problem. So I'm trying to capture nodes that are come and go in, in, for a small period of time. So on the, on the snapshot capturing, I'm not claiming any, any contribution. I'm just saying it's a difficult problem. If they have solved this to capture, have a really fast crawler, good for them. I'm just bringing out some of the problems that you have to deal with. My understanding is that, and I'm, I'm yet to see if there's a company doing this, great. I'm, I'm yet to see a result, research result. There are a lot of companies doing a lot of things. As long as we don't see them on the paper, it doesn't mean it's not going to help you to, to run your simulation. Yeah. Is that the scale of the web is far larger than any peer to peer system. That's right. Right. So the scalability challenges that you know Microsoft's crawler or Google's crawler, crawler has solved are far bigger. That's right. So that the, 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 I think that's a much bigger system, but slowly that I think it changes slowly. So that probably requires a slightly different approach. Yeah, but the amount of resources is slightly uncomparable. Uh, you absolutely. cannot absolutely get one hundred K machines just to do this experiment. That's right. Yes. So when your slave gets a list of neighbor, peer neighbors, right, it goes back to the master. The master tells whatever slaves to put these nodes on your on your queue. If they try to attempt, if they attempt to contact one of those peers and it doesn't respond, is it removed from the master list or right. do you keep it, saying that it was here at one point? Right. So this is like, this is what exactly what I said earlier. The moment you start thinking about designing this. The issue of how are you going to coordinate? What are the timeouts that you use? In fact, you're talking about timeouts. When do you decide to give up on a peer? If you set the timeout to be too large, you're slowing down the whole process. If you make the timeout to be too slow, the peer might be busy respond, and it takes a while to respond, and then you just move on. So we have done a lot of empirical sort of uh, testing to make sure that we get this. So we change the timeout and see how it affects the performance. So, there is a timeout associated to each connection. If we don't hear back from a peer within that timeout period, we assume that peer is unreachable. We report it back to the master saying this peer cannot be reached. We don't try that again. Now we have done a lot of further analysis to see why a peer is unreachable. I can go on and on and talk about those. For example, we, we, we found out that there are three groups of peers that are unreachable. Some of them that are just gone. Some of them are behind the NAT box and we cannot reach them. And some of them, which is the most interesting part, they're just overloaded. You know, if I contact the peer, it doesn't respond. I contact it, it doesn't respond. If I try again, it does respond. And it's a TCP refuse at the kernel level. So we sort of concluded that maybe these uh, nodes are, are just busy. This is sort of the only conclusion that we came up with. So what you said is, is an issue that should be addressed, and we dealt with it to the extent that was possible. Slaves literally in the same room. We also look into that. Does it make sense to run slaves distributed or put them all in? So right now, the way we run it is that the master and the slaves are all connected with the LAN and on the same LAN, basically. The problem that you run into is that if you start running them, say, on Planet Lab, run one of them on the East Coast, one of them in Europe, you can do that. The problem is that the coordination overhead is going to kill you because you have to just tightly keep them connected. And of course, the other alternative, I mean, you can go on and on with this. The point is, what is the, what is the improvement in fidelity of what you capture, right? You can run them distributed in a distributed fashion and with some loose coordination, meaning that it doesn't matter if you crawl a peer twice or five times. It's not a big, you have redundancy. We haven't gone that far. We basically explored a distributed version of it and we noticed that the overhead of running this is high because then the coordination overhead coordination traffic should compete with the actual crawling traffic 
You see what I'm saying? So then you have to have adaptation and all that. So these, for, for the, the results that I'm going to present, we have run all of them on the same LAN, basically. Sorry, the only reason to run the distributed crawler is not necessarily to increase the scale. It's also to... Distribute the load. No, the, to see whether the problems you're having in terms of contacting a particular machine are, are, are between your LAN network and that particular network. So temporary BGP dislocations, for example. So you might be able to contact up here from the East Coast, but not from, you know, from Oregon. That is true. If, the, if I have a reachability problem, but I'm reaching those, I get TCP refuse from them. That's, that, I'm, that, that, that alone would be interesting. How right. often was it the case that you, know, you couldn't completely reach them at all, as opposed to when you tried to contact them, you, know, you managed to get there, but you got it. I don't think reachability has ever been an issue to the point that we even put it on our table in terms of statistics and all. This percentage of people were unreachable at all. Oh, so yeah. Those so are just gone, right? Okay. Those are, you don't know. Whether they were gone no, that's, or whether right, right. No, that's a good point. Yeah. So the, the, the ones that we assume they're gone, which is around 4%, and I'll show it in the next slide, they, that could be true. That's a good point. So how do you find the first peer? Like you always have a group that you, wanna, that you use to bootstrap the process. So you can go to some of these bootstrapping nodes, get 100 or 10 or whatever peers. So that is like a, like a hard coder, you know that this guy is You can go and get it from some of these bootstrapping system that this used to for a new peer to join. We can start like a new peer, go and get a list of 10, and from there you can start crawling. Have you noticed any differences based on you know, your initial set of peers? Well, we, we randomize that. So if if I talk about the two different crawl back to back, they have a different starting point. You should keep in mind that this is a spaghetti ball. These nodes are randomly connected. So you can start from here and go there, or you can start from here and come here. So it's, it's there is not, they don't have, a, so the initial seeds do not have a major impact. Yeah, we have looked into that too. The, 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 bootstrap, the bootstrap mechanisms you're using, whether it's Natilla's bootstrap or whatever, do they verify that the nodes that they're giving you are actually reachable before they send them back to you? Or is it kind of, these are 10 I know at some point in time were valid? So I, I, right now, I don't remember the detail of whether they do like FIFO or whether they cache indefinitely. I don't know. But um, we haven't run to the problem that at least getting a list of 10 and a large fraction of them are unreachable because it's going to slow you down. So I can tell you that out of many crawls we have done, we have run into those anomalies that some of sometimes the crawl start come to a really slow start. And that could be one of the reasons could be the fact that most of the peer that you initially contacted were not there or just you were unlucky. So out of tens of thousands of crawls we have done, uh, some fraction of them and then you can tell the size of the crawl or it takes a very long time initially. So I'm glad that all these issues came up. So designing a crawler is not a rocket science, but it has a lot of detailed implementation and uh, sort of validation issues. So now, again, we have done a lot of testing to make sure what we capture is, is correct and also quantify, put some numbers in terms of error that we observe. So the problem is that you don't have a reference to compare with. If I say I have a complete snapshot, how, should I, how can I convince you that it is complete? So basically we came up with this way of validating, we run back-to-back -back crawlers, so back-to-back -back crawl. So we do a crawl and we control length of the crawl. So we crawl for say t seconds and as soon as we finish we start a crawl again from scratch. So these are two back-to-back -back crawl and then we control the duration of the crawl. So right now I'm showing two lines here. This one is the diff between back-to-back -back crawl as you increase the crawl length. This one is the number of peers you capture in uh, I think it's, it might be average in one of the crawls. So basically the trend that you see, and this is average of many experiments, it's not just one. As you increase crawl time, you start to capture more uh, peers. Okay? But, you're, but there's a diminishing return if you go beyond some point. It's just flattening out. You're not discovering much more. So the slope of this line shows you the, the, the gain of discovery, basically. At the same time, the difference between back-to-back -back crawl starts to flatten out. And this difference is due to churn, in our opinion, or there are some peers that are permanently unreachable from where we are. Okay? So this is a way for us to figure out when we stop the crawl, going back to your question. Again, the longer you go, 
the more distortion you introduce to the system. So you want to cut it the point that the gain of staying and doing more crawl is, is less than the distortion that it introduced to the system. So like now this point may be the valid, like what you are saying, like instead of running in, if you had a distributed crawler, in that case, like after 300 seconds, you might know new neighbors. But here, what is happening, you are saturating. Like you are not getting any new neighbors. No, 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 no. So the point that he made, see, the point that G2 made was there might be nodes that you cannot reach because of routing unreachable. Yeah. Now, I know about those nodes because other people reported that these peers are out there. This is a graph with high degree, so I find people. The likelihood that I don't even hear about someone with 30 neighbors is really, really low. The problem is that when I go and contact them, I cannot reach them. Okay? If you run a distributed crawler, there are chances, and this is completely hypothesis at this point. We don't have a number. We don't know what fraction of these 4% or 8% might have been reachable from some other point in the network. This is just hypothesis. I just want to... What are you saying is true. So, for example, suppose you had a completely partitioned uh, Nutella network, where half of it is in the U.S. and the other half is in India. Unless you're on the distributed crawler, you're not going to find the network in India. But at that time, you have to ask whether it even makes sense to call them one network or whether they're two networks. That, that's right. And, and then we have done some analysis. Like here, you are saturating means you are not getting new information. Like, whatever information you are getting, you might have contacted already. Why, why, why do you believe that there are new informations? I get that is, that is my question. What is the basis for knowing there are... No, no, so that was more... Except that extreme case of totally another Nutella network somewhere else, that then I question why is it part of this Nutella network, because I cannot exchange anything with it. Where, where are those informations that I cannot retrieve? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. No, why it saturates? Can you oh, it saturates because I reached, I, I've covered everyone. Yeah, so that was my point. Like that time maybe someone else is sitting there and that those two PR network may not be totally partitioned. There may be very slow link or something. If, 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 let me just try that again. If there is anyone out there, they roughly have 30 neighbors. The probability that I've never heard about any of those neighbors is really, really low. Does that, does that answer? No, what I'm saying that it may have two partition, but these two are not really completely partitioned. There may be very slow link or there may be very slow link because of these two connected. And I have missed all those links? Yeah, you might miss that. So if you have it two different... I'm sure you can come up with the scenarios like that, but given that this is a high degree network, a high degree graph, and we visualize it, the, the possibility of that is low, I think. I think most of the peer-to-peer -peer network, I mean, if you do have such a bottleneck... The system is not going to perform. The peer-to-peer -peer network yeah. itself is flawed. And such flawed network may not exist in the, uh, I mean, may not be that popular in the beginning. Yeah, two million people cannot be using that network of, you know, a million in India, a million in, in the U.S., and they are connected with two links, kind of. That, that is not going to function properly. Okay. On your delta, is it delta on the number of peers discovered, or is it delta on the peers you found? Like, we did a comparison of each peer, and this delta are the ones that did not occur in both? Yeah, so this is, this is the delta positive negative, both, if that's what you're saying. This is the one that were there in the first snapshot, not in here, or are here and not there. It's the one, it, it's it's a collection. It's the ones that are not in both. Uh, exactly, okay. exactly. So this is the, because that's what you care about, and it's about 8%. Mm -hmm. um, and then we pre introduced the notion of edge distortion, node distortion. I think I've, I've covered this, and then you're way ahead of me in terms of, the issue. So um, let me move on. So I just wanted to put this in the talk to show you that, again, even the simple task of, presumably simple task of capturing a snapshot and validating that what you're capturing is correct is not. Just, I mean, uh, basically to clarify, the vertical access in the change of peers is percentage, right? It's not the number of peers. So that's why basically when all That's right. That, that's right. This is percentage. Uh, thank you. That's percentage. Yeah, that, that should say it's a percentage. Yes. Yes. Do we have quota for number of questions for audience here or not? I have a random theoretical question. I'm not even, I don't even have this straight in my own head. But here is the idea, right? Suppose the peer selector, every peer selects its neighbors according to some sort of very biased process. Okay, so suppose every peer in the Redmond only knows about nodes in the Redmond. Mm -hmm. Then the chances that your discovery process will result in distortion are likely higher, right? Because if you miss a peer in Oregon, 
you're not going to find it about anybody in Oregon, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if each peer knows lots of random people, you know, nobody in the right one knows about people in Oregon, and go, Florida, and right. India, so all right. kinds of random edges. That's right. Chances that you will end up with high distortion are low. Right? Uh, still, it takes time. Eventually. No, no. It, it, the chances that you miss someone is low, but you yeah. still have distortion. Right. Bec- right. 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 But, right. but so, so, for a given number of iterations, the number of nodes you will discover are higher. Though. Right. If the if peers are selected, at the rate of discovery is higher because you go to new areas quickly. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so. Yes. Yeah, so I mean, yes. So we have looked at uh, uh, connectivity of this this network to see to what extent it has locality in it, if that's what you're saying. So we noticed that basically the simple result that I can tell you is that if you look at a Nutella snapshot in at one point of time, we look at what fraction of nodes are, say, in North America, what fraction of nodes are in China, what fraction of nodes are different region, and whether there is a bias in connectivity of nodes within that region. There is a slight bias but it's not heavy. So, for example, I don't remember the actual number. And the reason is obvious. When I go to a bootstrap to hear back, and then I contact some peers, I may be contacting someone in India, someone in China, and someone in California. The guy in California is going to respond. There is a bias, but it's not such a heavy bias that make the discovery essentially a phase discovery that gradually go to other geographic regions. So, and and the, the, the figure that I showed earlier, whatever mess it was, uh, that showed the overlay on the map, shows some of that. And then our new, uh, we have actually visualized the overlay and it's like a really huge spaghetti ball. That there are connections from everywhere to everywhere depending on how you lay it out. So like your seed might influence, you know, like if your seed has very, very locality centric, then that might influence your study. It's, it's, it's more like a question, not a... Right, so uh, I don't think even bootstrapping node in Nutella or any system give you you know, five nodes in the same land, or I'm going to tell it. They want to maintain this, so they give you diverse set of seats somewhat so you can make, so each, each node try to have diverse connection to maintain that property. Maybe let's move the talk forward. Because we already started something like 15 minutes, uh, basically late. We want to hear the whole talk. Uh, okay. Let's pull our question forward. So, no, I mean, short questions are fine. Just, just keep... <laughs> So, okay, so we, the first thing you need to decide when you want to do a measurement study on peer-to-peer system is what system. And whatever you end up measuring, people say, why didn't you measure another one? So we end up measuring Nutella for, if nothing else, for one reason. And that is because it, this is probably one of those systems who have been in use and growing popularity for the past five, six years. There are a lot of systems who came around and became popular for a few months and then they went away. So it's a very mature system. It has been around for a long time. It's very large. It has open specification. So we know how to interact with the node. We don't need to reverse engineer anything. I'm personally suspicious of any study who does re- when they do reverse engineering and capturing traffic and trying to figure out what's going on. Because that could introduce some major flaws, which you cannot verify. That is the most difficult problem. Um, it, uh, Gnutella has a two-tier overlay. The top overlay, essentially the group of peers that we refer to as ultra peers, connect to each other and they build a top level overlay. And then other, a large fraction of nodes are leaves that are hanging from the overlay connecting to multiple ultra peers. This essentially gives you a better scalability, uh, a scaling properties. And this idea has been incorporated on many other uh, peer-to-peer systems. Now, we want to do two things. We want to characterize two aspects of Gnutella. We want to look at graph properties. We want to look at one snapshot and say what are the properties of the resulting graph that they are shaped, that are forming. And also you want to look at dynamics. How does this graph evolve with time? Okay? And we're going to be focusing only on the top level overlay, the nodes that are up here, not the ones that are hanging. It's just easier to look at that. Just to give you some numbers, after the discussion we had for snapshots, we have captured, I guess right now we have more than 100,000 snapshots over the past three years. Um, these are some sort of a statistics to see uh, the date that we captured a snapshot, total number of nodes, uh, number of leaves, ultra peer, you see the leaves are sort of five, six times larger, and the number of edges in the top level overlay, just between ultra peers. Okay, so the graph that I'm going to be talking about and focusing on are this. For static properties, I'm going to be looking at individual snapshot, one snapshot at a time. Okay, 
then I want to look at dynamic properties. For dynamic properties, we look at a slice of time, which is 48 hours. So we crawl Nutella once every five, five minutes or seven minutes. So we crawl Nutella, again crawl, crawl, crawl. So for 48 hours, we keep crawling Nutella. So if you keep looking at those snapshots, essentially it's like playing back what happened to Nutella overlay over the past uh, 48 hours. And we have uh, four or five slices of data, four or five 48 hour slices of time to look at to uh, examine dynamics of the overlay. Okay, here is a laundry list of analysis we have done. They're all in the paper. Uh, I'm not going to go, basically, I'm not going to cover them. I'm going to be talking mostly on the degree distribution for graph properties and talk about um, uh, some dynamic properties just to give you a flavor of uh, analysis we have conducted. All right, the, f the first sort of graph properties that people often look at when you have a graph is degree distribution. Okay, let's look at degree distribution to get a sense of connectivity. Here what you see on log log scale is uh, degree distribution of P ultra peers, only P on the top level overlay for the four snapshots that I was talking about. And they're pretty much consistent. Uh, you have two peaks at 30 and 75. These are the numbers that are used by LimeWire and BearShare, two major implementation of uh, um, Gnutella. There are some nodes that have a really high degree, presumably monitoring, or they have messed around with their uh, code to have many neighbors. And there's a large number of neighbors that have less uh, nodes that have less neighbors. Presumably these are the nodes that join the system than trying to find enough neighbors. Because when you go on contact theory, not all of them are available. Some of them may not accept you, some of them may be gone. So you have to work your way to that target. So nothing about this is surprising, but the question is, what do we expect to see? Well, if you go and look at some of the previous work, the expectation was that this should be power law. This should look like um, this graph. So previous studies, some of the most cited one, basically claim that this is the degree distribution in Gnutella. And there is no way to dispute that. Then we did the study and then we saw two major pick. Again, this, there is nothing power law about this. There are two pronounced peak in log scale. And then, what is on? Means that node, means the time they bootstrap and that till you capture the data. Uh huh. So all nodes are at the same time, or like. So, so we take it takes five minutes for us to to crawl the network. Okay. Five to seven minutes. Now, what was the question? So my point is like, as you mentioned, kind of like the nodes who just joined, he may not have less neighbor and not the node who joined for a long time that may have... Hold on to that thought. Hold on to that. So then, we, this is what people believe to be the case. Uh, the result that I showed was the result that we conduct, sort of drive, and we, we believe it's correct. How do you address this difference? So we were suspicious that the snapshot they used was distorted because they capture a much, much smaller number of nodes in a much, much longer time. So to address this, we started to crawl with the slower rate, with the slower speed. So slow, we slow down our crawler, okay? And here is, is the degree distribution from a slow crawler with the blue line, and here is the degree distribution from a fast crawler, one of the results from the previous graph. So you see that as we make the crawler slower, a line starts to form here, and it starts to resemble that. But what's going on? Basically, as you make the crawler slower, there are, there are increasing number of short-lived peers that announce a long-lived peer as a neighbor. But they are not the neighbor of that peer at the same time. So if you crawl the system at one hour, you might have hundreds of short-lived peers who come and go for five minutes and say, oh, that guy, that long-lived guy was my neighbor. But they were not in the system at the same time. They come and go during the hour of... And that is the cause for this shape. Essentially, this, this has to do with the way churn uh, the dynamic of the system and the way churn uh, behaves. So we believe the result that they reported is due to the uh, distortion under a snapshot and sort of this is an explanation of if you go and crawl the Gnutella today with a slow crawler and don't add the distortion, you're going to see the same thing. Um, one of the tricky things about this since we talk about a lot of these details is that if you make the crawler very slow, you may never finish crawling because there are always new peers coming in, so you cannot make it too slow, at least when the system is large. So that is one of the uh, results that sort of uh, dismissed previous finding, I believe. 
This dynamic part is, is an interesting one because then we have a lot of graphs, back-to-back -back snapshots of the overlay. We wanted to capture this dynamic, but we had no way of capturing dynamics of an overlay. We talked to the graph people and say, how do you represent dynamics of a graph? And we didn't find anything. Maybe we haven't looked hard enough. So, but the question you want to answer is that you have a spaghetti ball. And this spaghetti ball is changing. Some peers come, some peers go. When a peer comes, it establishes new edges. When a peer goes, it sort of clean up the edges. Is there a region in that spaghetti ball that is more stable? Is there a, are there a group of peers that are long-lived and establish connection and keep their connection? Is part of the spaghetti ball more stable than the rest of it? And the question is, how do you find a spaghetti ball in a, uh, how do you find a region in a spaghetti ball? How do you cut pieces and say, okay, this is a region? Remember, these are random connections. So here is the methodology that we adopted. We have back-to-back -back snapshots. Each box, think of it as a snapshot. And then you can think of peers that are in that snapshot. This is 48 hours of back-to-back -back snapshot. If you look at the last snapshot, you can go back and see how long a peer that is present here been in the system. Okay? And then each snapshot is five minutes. You can multiply that appearance by five minutes and get a, a lower bound for its uptime. Okay? So I can focus only on this last snapshot and annotate each peer with its uptime. This peer has been around for five minutes, ten minutes, twenty-five minutes, for example. Okay? Now, I want to group peers based on their uptime and say these are long lived one, medium lived one, short lived one, okay? And then I look at the connectivity between each group. This is basically where I'm going. To see whether peers that are long lived are more likely to get connected to each other or they're biased. So we talk about bias in a regional sense. This is a bias between peers that are more stable. Okay, so this graph essentially shows you the distribution of peers who have been in the system X hours or longer. So for example, 20% um, of peers in the system have been uh, around for 20 hours or longer. So there are some very long-lived peers in the system, but most of the peers are short-lived, essentially. That's what it shows from different, snap, from different slices. So now, here is again the hypothesis. If I group peers that, are, that I consider stable, and stability is a relative term, peers that have been around tau hours or more, okay, and I call them a stable core. These are a stable group of people. Uh, is the connectivity between this stable group more than connectivity between them and the rest of the peers? Assuming it was a totally random graph. This is what you want to show. And then, of course, by changing this threshold, you can change the size of your stable core. Right? The, the larger the tau, the smaller the group. The smaller the, t the tau, the larger the group. So, and the hypothesis was that a long-lived peer has been around for a long time, has had more chance to connect to other long-lived peers. So there is the possibility that long-lived peers connect to each other and form a stable core. Why does it matter? Because they form the center of the overlay and they help with the routing, if there is a sort of a central piece that is uh, stable. Um, so again, we, co we compare the connectivity between group of peers that have been around more than towers and compare that connectivity with a totally randomized version of uh, connection between those peers, maintaining the same degree for each peer, okay? And here is the result. If you look at this is time, if you change the value of tau, this is the increase in, in connectivity. So, for a group of peers who have been in the system 20 hours or more, there are 20% more likely to connect with each other compared to nodes outside. If you look at people who have, peers who have been in the system 45 hours, there is 30%. It's not a huge bias, but there is some bias. The way you should think about it is that the connectivity in, the, in that spaghetti ball essentially is like an onion-like. The nodes in the core have a really biased connectivity, 30% or so. The other nodes with same uptime form a layers that are connected to each other mostly and not in, in, ter in internal layers. That is essentially the form uh, that this represents. Despite the fact that you have churned, long-lived ones find each other and form some sort of a core part of the network and the rest are sort of in layers around them, essentially. Again, there is only 30%. It's not a really pronounced, strong bias. Um, okay, so this was another interesting result simply because you get some interesting property out of nothing. There is nothing that explicitly enforces this. 
but by the fact that longly ones find each other essentially is a good property in the system that for stability of the overlay. All right, let me finally move on to the topic that I think is the most interesting. And going back to the issue of measurement, measuring or capturing a complete snapshot of peer-to-peer -peer system is difficult. As this system becomes larger, it's essentially a losing battle. You cannot always capture a complete snapshot. For one, argue it's complete. Argue it doesn't have distortion. It's just a difficult thing to do. The question is that uh, it's, a, it's a heavyweight, so it, it, it introduces a heavy load in the system. The question is that how can you sample this system, capture a subset of peers, and show that it's representative? Other studies essentially do this quietly and implicitly by saying, oh, we do a quick crawl, and then we use this as a sample. But they haven't basically take, done the effort of showing it's representative. Okay. So what do you want to do by, what do you want to sample? Essentially you want to sample peer properties. By peer property I'm referring to any property associated with individual peers, such as number of neighbors or degree, number of files, uptime, anything that associated with a peer is peer property. We want to measure that. You cannot measure global properties based on sample. I cannot look at the diameter of the graph by capturing only 100 peers, because I don't have the entire graph. Okay? Now, the way you should do this is that you have to first discover the graph. We don't know anything about the overlay. We have to discover at least portion of the graph. We have to select some of the peers. So you may discover 1,000 peers. You select 100 of them. And then for those peers, you go and measure the property you want. You go to those peers and say, what is your degree? So there are two phases. There is a discovery and selection. And there is also measurement of the particular problem, particular uh, property that you're interested in. Okay. Now, ideally, if we had the entire overlay in front of us, what we wanted to do is to wanted to select uniformly at random a subset of peers. If you do that, your samples are representative. The question is, how do you select uniformly at random a subset of peers from a graph that is unknown and is changing? There are two sources of bias. There are two causes that make you select a specific set of peers more than others. One is temporal and one is topological. I'll talk about those. I'll talk about individual uh, issue separately and then uh, combine them. Okay, so let's assume we have a graph and it's dynamic, but we have a way of selecting a random node. There is a magical way of doing that. If you sample the, a subset of nodes over delta second, over a period of delta, you sample anyone who shows up. Essentially, you are selecting from any peer that showed up in the system during that interval. So anyone that comes to the system during that delta second could be a sample, okay? And this, is, uh, this, is, this has some side effect. Here is an example to show you what is a side effect. Consider a toy example when you have a long-lived peer and a short-lived peer that comes, goes away, another short-lived peer comes and goes away. If you sample the system during that interval in the box, there is a three-time chance more that you select a short-lived one compared to a long-lived peer, okay? So your selection is biased towards short-lived ones. It's worse than that. If you have a bigger window, there is even more chance that you select the short-lived ones, okay? So depending on the delta you choose, this approach has the temporal bias towards short-lived peers. And this is what most of these previous studies have done. Now, how should we address that? The problem here is that we are selecting peers, but we should be selecting peer properties. In a nutshell, what it means is that if I select a peer now, next, I have to put it back in the basket and say next time I still should be able to select that peer. Okay? Meaning that we have to sort of select property of individual peer, not peer with certain identity. Okay? So, measure, selecting a peer at two different reading is, is perfectly valid, essentially resampling of that peer. Now, let's go back to our example. If you do that, at any point of time, there is a chance that you select the shortly one or longly one. So it doesn't matter where you do it, when you do it, you essentially end up the 50-50 chance of selecting longly one or shortly one. Why? Because we are not setting aside the longly one once we select it. We go back to it again and select this property. Remember, we are interested in peer properties. What I mean is that if this ends up being a sample, we select A's degree. 
We say, okay, that is one sample. The next time that we go, if we end up selecting this peer again, we select its degree again. That is another sample. If you don't do that, you'll be biased towards the short-lived peers. Now, let's go back and address the issue that I said we can do magically. How do you, if I give you a static graph, there is no dynamic. So we look at the dynamic here, assuming that you can magically select a peer at random. Okay? Now, let's just stop and assume that there is no dynamic. If I give you a graph, how can you randomly select a peer from that graph? This is the problem that we want to uh, address now. Um, basically, you have to do discovery. You have to start from one peer, get the neighbors, and then you can do some of these classic techniques of uh, scanning a graph, breadth first search, depth first search. Um, and then you select the subset. Okay? And then go sample some of this graph. So the problem is that um, the, the discovery result in correlation based on degree. You are more likely to see the long-lived peers than short-lived ones. Okay? If you have a peer that has high degree, as you discover the graph, it's proportionally more likely that you discover that peer as opposed to a, a short-lived ones, uh, low-degree ones. And in these uh, techniques, you typically, you, know, you always select the peer just once, okay? A better way to do it is random walk. You essentially want to do a random walk in the system, and you select a subset of peers, and then you go and measure their properties. The good thing about random walk is that the, it doesn't really matter where you start, because you take random steps, no matter where you start, the, initial, the effect of initial seed is gone after a few steps. Um, the results are still biased. Even in random walk, you are more likely to hit a high degree peer. But we know exactly how that bias affects, and then we can compensate for that. So that's a key issue. And yeah, there, you can always select the same peer multiple times, which is what we wanted to avoid a bias towards short lived. So, so if you just do a generic random walk, you have a trans this is sort of a more formal view of the problem. You have a transition function, transition uh, metrics. The, ch the probability that go from node X, you are at node X right now, in, to go to node Y is 1 over the degree of X if they are neighbors. If they are not neighbors, the probability is 0. For multiple uh, step, basically you are taking this probability multiple time. Uh, essentially, it converges to this value for X. The chances that you select node X is degree of X over 2 times of all the edges. But this is not a degree you want. This basically means the high degree node is much more likely. It's twice more likely than a node with half a degree to be selected. But remember, we want to select nodes uniformly at random. We want the probability of selecting a node would be 1 over number of nodes. If you have 1,000 nodes, there is 1 over 1,000 probability to select a node. Random walk, generic random walk, doesn't give us that. But it turns out that, that there is a version of random walk called, uh, called Metropolis Hastings uh, method for walk that allows you to have any probability of selection. So if, if the probability that you want is, is mu, you can just plug it in, and then you have the generic p, x, 1, and y, and then you can generate any probability distribution that you want. Essentially, by, by playing with the probability of transition, you can get the overall probability of selection for individual node. So here is basically the mechanically, here is how it's going to work. So, you are at node X, you select a neighbor Y randomly. I know the list of neighbors for X. I select a random node Y, which is a neighbor. Then I look at, the, then I, the probability that I take, I step and go to Y is degree of X over degree of Y. Now, if Y has a low degree, X has a high degree, it's a high chance that I go to Y. If y has a high degree, x has a low degree, it's a less probability that I go to y. So this is a way to compensate for the higher tendency of going to high degree peers. Okay? But it's not just a ratio that we came up with. There is actual theory behind it that if you do this, you end up having 1 over v ratio. The probability of selecting a peer is not proportional to its degree. It's uniformly at random. Okay? Now, if you don't, if this probability is not met, so if we don't take this step, what's going to happen? We select X again as a sample. So I'm at this peer. With that probability, I go to Y. If not, I sample X again. 
And remember, I, resampling is fine. So now, in practice, there are some other issues that you have to deal with. The first one is that there is a node that I know about, or there is a node that I want to step to, but the node is gone. So I have to add some backtracking to the system to go to the previous step and start all over. So we added some stack and backtracking, so you go to the previous step and start from there. Uh, now, all I said about metropolis hasting is valid for a static graph. I have a dynamic graph. The $64,000 question is, does met sort of metropolis random walk result in an unbiased uh, sort of values or are biased samples on a dynamic graph? Well, if the graph changes really slowly, it doesn't matter. By the time it changes, you have finished your walk. If the graph changes really fast, it's unlikely that you get an unbiased result. The question is that there are scenarios in between that happen in reality. Is Metropolis Hastings giving you uh, an unbiased result? And if it's biased, how much is this bias? Or one condition it gives you unbiased result? That is the question you want to answer. So what we did is that we came up, we sort of do some session level simulation. It doesn't have to be packet level to answer this question. And then um, we try to answer scenarios that lead to bias. And then the question is whether those scenarios happen in practice. Sort of find the limit of where it works. The first thing that you need to address when you want to solve that problem is that so, so far I've been saying peer properties, peer properties, peer properties. The answer to all these questions could be different for different peer properties. If I show you degree, the answer might be unbiased, but if I show you bandwidth, the answer might be biased. If you think about it, instead of looking at all the properties, I'm going to be focusing only on those properties that interact with the walk. And those are degree, session length, um, because it's dynamic, and query, because steps are, I have to query up here. These are the, I claim these are the only three properties that interact with the walk. If there is a property like number of files, like bandwidth, that doesn't interact with the property, does not ha have an effect on my sample. If I show that the result for these properties are unbiased, they have to be unbiased for every other property, because those properties do not interact with the, with the walk. And instead of showing you a lot of distribution for those properties, I basically show you the KS statistics, which is the largest gap between a distribution from an oracle, it's a simulation, I have the oracle, and the result from samples. So I have a distribution from samples, this is lightweight one, I have distribution from oracle, the difference between two, the KS difference between the, them shows the relative notion of error, how accurate my snapshots, uh, the re, this distribution from samples are. And then we look at all dimensions. We look at effect of churn, make it dynamic. We look at the effect of, we have time till 10.30, right? Yeah, 10.30. Okay. And then we are done with Q&A, so I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we look at the effect of churn. If you make it more dynamic, different types of dynamic, what's going to happen? If you change the degree distribution, if you change the connectivity, what's, how it's going to affect the bias? And if you have different discovery technique, the bootstrapping mechanism, what peer I provide, because that is start, that affects the system. So these are the three angles that we explore to see how it affects the results. This is a, the, the very basic case where we show the distribution of degree, this is a CCDF, for a snapshot and samples. This is the distribution of session length across samples and uh, an oracle snapshot. And then they are at least visually, you cannot distinguish them. But it doesn't mean anything because it might be a scaling factor. Basically the D value, KS statistics, D value is less than 0.004. It's very small. So they're very close um, for this base case that I specified here. This is the distribution of churn. Again, for churn you have to have uptime distribution. What distribution for uptime you're using? What is the median value and things like that? And degree and target degree. Now, yes. So there, the whole problem here is that you might bias, uh, you might uh, sample, if, if you sample naively using depth first search or uh, uh -huh. depth first search or even just random walk, mm -hmm. the problem is that you might sample short lived peers more often, right? Uh, and you, you end up sampling the high degree peers more often. Okay, fine. And the high degree peers are likely to be the ones that are long lived. Um, there is a correlation, yeah, but you're right. Okay. In Nutella, ultra peers are likely to be high degree. What is that? Ultra peers are likely to have high degree. Is that a 
true statement. What peers? In, in Nutella, the ultra peers. Ultra peers? Yes. No, not necessarily. No. The, the, when you stay in the system, if there is a demand for ultra peer, you become high, you become ultra peer. But you might stay in the system, there is no demand, and then you won't. But typically, you have to stay in the system long enough to, one of the criteria for becoming ultra peers is, is that. But go ahead. I'm just wondering whether it's sufficient to simply randomly throw in, I don't know how. Um, randomly? If you happen to visit a peer with a high degree, uh -huh. okay, or, or depending on how you want to correct the bias, or, or, or a short-lived peer, right. just, just throw it away. Don't, don't use that sample. No, no, no. So, uh, wait, wait a minute. Forget about ultra peer versus non ultra peer. Just right. let's just focus on ultra peer. Okay. 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 I have a graph. Yeah. It is dynamic and it's and all that. I have two choices. I either have to capture a complete snapshot, which is distorted, as we discussed, or I want to look at samples. Okay. Now, are you saying there are certain ways that you can do sampling? I have to include short lived in my sample. Okay. I, I want to sham I, I want to represent session time. Session time includes short-lived ones. Are you saying that we should throw away shortly? I, I didn't understand the question. Yeah. Okay, so suppose, ignore the fact, ignore short-lived versus long-lived. Mm -hmm. Let's simply consider high degree versus low degree, right? Uh -huh. The problem is that you're likely to bias towards uh, peers with high degree. That's right. What I'm saying is that rather than, is one possible way of correcting the bias as follows, which is when you visit a high degree peer, right. with some probability, simply throw it away. But that's ex the exact question is that probability. So. Yeah. Uh, so what you're saying, bluntly put, is an ad hoc way of yeah. what the metropolis random walk. So ra metropolis random walk, so you're saying, well, you're more biased towards long lived peer. Try to compensate by that bias, but throw them away. Yeah. The question is, what is that probability and how, and metropolis random walk, if I, if I presented this and I say, well, we do this and we 20% of the time we throw it away. This guy would have asking, why 20%? Why not 15%? Now I have this theory that essentially, so it's theoretically grounded. I have a reason to show theoretically for a static graph, it's unbiased. I think the most interesting part, which is a contribution of this work, is that what happens when you go to dynamic case? Because then you have the interaction of these topology bias that you can deal with and dynamic of peers that, you, that uh, metropolis uh, Hastings does not address that we have to deal with. And these are the results that we are showing right now. Here I'm showing the effect of churn. If I make the system more dynamic, what's going to happen? So here, this is a median session length. Uh, of course, the longer the median session length, the more stable the system is. Uh, and I'm showing this for a different type of churn. These are different distribution for churn. It could be Pareto, it could be Babel, it could be exponential. There are different distribution for peer opt session length. You should see that as the system becomes more stable, the D statistics uh, for degree distribution, the difference between Oracle and my sample are quickly going down. So if the median session length is more than a couple of minutes, the error is really low. And it doesn't have much dependency to what kind of churn you're using. Depending on, regardless of what kind of churn you're using, the error is really low if you're looking at degree. As long as you're in this region. Actually, you can even go further and go to this region. Okay? The same thing is pretty much true if you're looking at session length. Remember, these are the three basic properties that I wanted to look at. Session length, degree, and uh, latency that I don't have latency result there, but it's pretty much the same. So again, if the uh, median session length is more than, actually, uh, I take that back, around 20 minutes, then uh, you're fine. Meaning that the results from samples are very, very close to the results from the oracle. So samples are unbiased. Um, so then, if you want to look at the effect of topology, so the previous one was the effect of dynamic, if I make the graph more dynamic. If I make the graph more connected, if I make the graph bushier, increase the degree, basically what you see is that as, lo as, as, as long as you have a degree average degree of more than four, or target degree of more than four, remember this is a dynamic graph. So if I set a target degree, you may not reach the target degree immediately. You lose neighbor, you find neighbor. So that process, always there are some nodes with a degree less than target. Some nodes might be with a degree higher than target because I allow them to go with a higher degree. The, the bottom line is, if you have a target degree of four or higher, then you have a really low error in the system. Meaning that the unbiased samples, uh, the samples give you an unbiased result. Uh, compared to the oracle. The same thing is true for session length. 
this line that you see happens, and these are different types of uh, bootstrapping. Because again, bootstrapping affects the connectivity. Do I give you some people who just arrived? Do I give you some random subset? Um, and so de depending on different type of uh, bootstrapping that are often used out there, uh, results might be different, but we see that they don't have an impact. Again, the D value is really small, um, meaning that the result from samples and the result from Oracle are the same. This is an anomaly that comes up when you go um, uh, in, 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 in the history case, there are scenarios uh, for, for nodes with no neighbors. I think you go to a node and then you lose your neighbor and then you get a stock. So this is one problem that we uh, experienced. The other problem that I, I think was even more interesting than is that you go to a node with degree of one, so the choices to get out of that node is just one neighbor. So you have that probability of degree x to degree y and then you get a stock there. And that is an anomaly that could cause this. So apart from this, there is an anomaly. For the most part, you can get a good result from your sample. So we have also tested that on an actual system. It's not just simulation. So we have a tool that you give it how many samples you want and how long you want it to go. And it goes and basically gives you the IP address and the port number of those samples, sample peer. And then you can go and look at those peers. So this is a result comparing degree distribution from a full crawl using cruiser, a short crawl, just a quick crawl for a few minutes, and sampling. So you see that the result for sampling, which is the black one, is much closer to the uh, full crawl, and short crawl is up there. Short crawl is sort of have inflated degree for high degree nodes. Remember, it's more biased towards high degree node. These two are closer. So these two are closer, and we believe this is even more accurate. Sampling is even more accurate to full crawl, because full crawl has distortion. But short crawl uh, uh, samples do not have distortion problem. So this is, again, some more of a validation with the actual experiment. So I guess the main takeaway point here is um, this sampling technique seems to give you unbiased results. So let me conclude, um, I guess, the main message or the main takeaway point from this talk is that I think it's really important to characterize these systems that are widely deployed and have a huge impact on the internet. Uh, and the problem is that it's not an easy task. It's difficult to capture their uh, snapshot accurately and argue and that what you capture is an accurate representation uh, in order to do analysis. So we have done a fair amount of work looking at the complete snapshot, trying to quantify the distortion. And we sort of dismiss some of the previous results and show that this is, for the most part, must be, we cannot prove it, but must be due to distortion. And then we present this notion of sampling as a lightweight. It doesn't have to be measurement. It could be a monitoring technique. You have a system, you want to monitor it. You don't want to crawl it again and again and again. It's just a heavy load. You can have a lightweight technique like sampling to visit a small fraction of nodes and sort of say something meaningful about your uh, system. Um, now, we have a lot of, lot of resources that we are currently putting online, a lot of snapshots, tools, and models. So if you want to run a simulator, you have a model there that you can plug it into your simulator. We have actually a simulator that you can use to do your uh, research. Uh, very quickly, a couple of other things that we are currently working on. We are looking at other sampling technique. There is a technique called the snowball sampling. This is used to identify the uh, fraction of hidden population. So for example, you want to know the fraction of HIV positive uh, pop sort of folks in the population. This is a technique that is used for that. It's called respond driven or snowball sampling. We want to sort of adopt that for sampling peer-to-peer -peer networks. And our preliminary results showed that it should give you a good result. Now that we have a technique, you want to push the efficiency. How efficient is this? How many, what is the minimum number of samples I need? I don't want to go on and on and sample. If I can get a result with 100 samples as opposed to 1,000, I want to go with 100. We want to learn more about the sort of a performance issue. Um, this is, the second bullet is more about the impact of peer-to-peer -peer system on network. I keep saying, well, they have a lot of impact on the system, but someone could say, so, so, tell me something more meaningful about the impact. Now, we are basically, what we do right now is that we look at individual, we grab an overlay, we have a peer-to-peer -peer connection, we try to find the underlying AS level path using simulator, but it gives you a good estimate. 
And then you want to see how does this load, using connectivity as a, lo as, as, a, as a measure of load. How many connections go through that AS? How many connections go through this AS? What is the distribution of these connections across ASs using connection as a unit of load? And then we have some interesting results to show that out of a few thousand ASs, only a few hundred of them are even, don't even, I mean, even matter for this. Many ASs don't even see them. And what ASs are the most ASs that generate traffic and one ASs that are most the, the main one they're carrying and things like that. We are doing some modeling for overlay. Instead of looking at overlay as a random graph, we are looking at overlay using a, a, a methodology called HOT, highly optimized tolerance, I think. This is used for uh, modeling physical network. Now we are using it to model peer-to-peer uh, -peer overlays. And we are also doing some more work on uh, characterizing DHTs, which is an area that I think have not been... There are a lot of work on simulating and designing DHTs, but there's not much work on understanding how the existing DHT, the few of them that are out there these days, are behaving. Um, and with that, I stop. And again, you can go to that web page at the bottom and basically learn more about this project. And here is a sort of a list of some of the publications we have on this topic. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes. So you've done all this analysis on very large peer-to-peer -peer networks. Have you done any correlation between your techniques to figure out the accuracy on smaller peer-to-peer -peer graphs versus these multiple million nodes graphs? Is it uh, as effective to do sampling on a small peer-to-peer -peer graph of a few thousand or a few hundred thousand? Um, so two, uh, a couple of thoughts on that. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know of a small peer-to-peer -peer uh, sort of system out there that I can... It hasn't been on concern to look at the small ones because the obvious question is that they're not big enough to matter. That's the first question. Intuitively, I don't see any reason that looking at the smaller graph would be more challenging or what, funda what is fundamentally different about those. You see what I'm saying? So it's, a, it's easier to capture the complete snapshot. You might as well just go for a complete snapshot. It takes us probably a minute. Um, but sampling techniques are, as I showed, are sort of, there is a theory behind it. So as long as uh, the degree is within a range. So the sampling technique, I claim, is this generic. You can use this sampling to sample web. Okay? As long as the degree is within the range, as long as the dynamic is within the range, that's, this should work. This is sampling properties of nodes in a dynamically dynamic graph. So I claim that if a system has a support to give you the information of neighbors, this should work. This is based on the theory. This is not just... The part that we added was the notion of dynamic and different types of graphs. So, so no, we haven't looked at this smaller graph, but I don't see why it should not work. And the reason we haven't is because of interest, interest factor. I have a question. Like so you mentioned that they have something called ultra PR and the leaves. Yeah, leaves. So right. my, I was thinking maybe it's a more like a theoretical thinking uh -huh. that instead of doing sampling or, or like how can't we like, is it possible, is it a valid assumption that in an ultra PR, those who are connected, the, they most of them has the same characteristics? On similar characteristics. So where is that hypothesis coming from? Why should we believe that is the no, case? That is my question. I don't know how the their graphs are structured. So my thinking is that the ultra peers are more like a uh, n by n mesh. No, no. Oh, okay. So it, it's an it's a random graph. So the top level overlay is a random graph. Okay. okay. When you have enough number of uh, and then they connect to each other and they also support leaves. Okay. If there is a mechanism in each node that if you go and try to find ultra peers and if you don't find one, if you have certain property, you can promote yourself and say, hey, I'm ultra peer and try to connect to ultra peers. Wow. So it's essentially a randomly connected, dynamic and flexible one. And the cool thing about this system, if you think about it, you know, it's, it's, if you are a designer of a system like this that has multiple versions in place, different people are having their own version, Designing something and, and, and adding new feature is difficult. Basically, they have an update mechanism that if you start your application, they say, oh, there's a new version. And that's how you can quickly propagate new features. So if you get something wrong, if you have this promotion, demotion technique, 
wrong, then you can essentially screw up your network. So they have this thing that they try out, and if it's not working, they update. But no, there is nothing like that. There is not a complete mesh. It's dynamic and evolving. Let's close the park. Because I've already been informed there's another talk. Oh, OK. So we have to yield our rooms. All right. Let's thank Professor Riza for his excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you.